You're listening to the Yeshiva of Newark at IDT podcast. I'm your host and curator, Rabbi Aprom Kivalevich, and I hope you enjoy this episode. You've bought your tickets. The ushers are about to open the doors. Yes, the projection has smicha is about to start. But first, if you own a retail business and accept credit cards, your customers are getting points, miles, and all sorts of rewards every time they use their card. And you're paying the price. That's why NRS Pay, a product of National Retail Solutions, a division of the IDT Corporation, offers its cash discount program, FeeBuster. You can start accepting credit cards for free. If your business process is over $18,000 a month, you pay no monthly fee and $0 out of your pocket for transaction. This means you, as a retailer, can enjoy the benefits of accepting plastic and your customers still get those crucial miles they crave and need. NRS Pay Fee Buster provides every client with a free credit card reader with no long-term contract, no early termination fee, cancel anytime without a penalty. I'm personally familiar with this company, and they truly stand by their product, and they'll help you with live, stateside-based customer service on any issue or question. Visit nrspay.com or call 833-289-2767 to learn more about NRS Pay and the fantastically fair fee buster. Clear the aisles. The projectionist has Micha. Hi, we're back. After the Passover break, after Pesach break, we're back. As you know, our last program was about highlighting women directors. And we talked about Ida Lupino, Dorothy Arzner. Yitzchak's wife, Chava Kolakowski, reminds me of a film that made quite a strong impression upon her uh, that won the Venice International in 1970, I think it was. Uh, it was the uh, a, a film called Wanda. Now, I was not familiar with this film at all, but uh, Chava, why don't you hold forth a little bit about what makes this film special, especially as, uh, as we say, we, the, the woman director who wrote and starred in it, Barbara Loden. So talk about this film and, and why it's special to you and what you think a person could get out of watching it and what sort of messages do you think the film has? Okay, so... Basically, Wanda is a 1970 movie written, directed, and starring Barbara Loden, who was Elliot Kazan's wife. She was inspired to write this after, she said it's semi-autobiographical, which I'm not really sure how, but she said she was inspired to write it after reading an article about a woman who went on the run with a bank robber. So basically, we open with Wanda. She's staying on her sister's couch after leaving her husband. They live in basically coal country in Northeast Pennsylvania. And it's a very bleak landscape. There's a lot of, there's a very, very long shot of Wanda walking through coal fields to get to her place of employment, which is kind of a weird shot. Anyway, Barbara Loden made this movie for $113,000. So it's very like low budget, but it's very interesting. So basically the next scene, she's fired from her job. And then the next scene, she's, literally wearing curlers and smoking a cigarette and she goes into court to hand over custody of her children to her estranged husband Hmm. then she leaves and she has like 16 dollars, which is what she was paid from getting fired by from her last job and she basically goes to this bar there's a guy there and she thinks he's the bartender but he's actually robbing the bar she basically flings herself at his mercy and is like look i'm stranded i don't you know i don't have 16 dollars. i don't have where to go i'm really really i can't go back to my sister's house help me and he is like yeah sure you can come with me and basically he reveals over time to her that he's a bank robber and that his goal is to get to see his father who is basically i don't want to say he's a pastor but he's almost like the guru of this Holy Land USA place in Waterbury, Connecticut. So it's basically a road trip story from then on out where they're Uh just robbing banks. So, so in other words, the motif of the, you know, the mall with the the gangster, which was done so often in Hollywood. And of course uh, it was mimicked in real life, of course, by the, um, by the Nebraska murders, by the way, the Starkweather murder case, there is actually a new five part documentary about the real facts in the case, which you can catch on Showtime, which I think is streaming right now. But every, but, but, but that really, you know, Chava, 
was sort of already had been done in many films in the 50s. You know, there were films where the star a whole series of actors and actresses of of the young love on the run and, you know, people getting involved, they drive by night and a whole bunch of other films where, you know, these two people are somehow thrown together and they shouldn't really be there and they might even be destructive with each other, but somehow they stay together because that's what human beings do and, you know, they take them along that path. Do they get involved in crime? I mean... Yeah, they're Robin Banks, basically from where they are in Northeast Pennsylvania until they get to Connecticut. And it's quite a long journey. I'm not sure why it takes so long. That's not really explained in the movie. Mm-hmm. And Wanda's about, she's about like pushing 40, right? I mean, she's, uh, again, the actress who plays her, Barbara Loden, was about, you know, was, was about 38 when she made this film, 37, 38. So is part of the film the fact that she's depressed, that, you know, that she doesn't know where her life is, her beauty is fading? Is that part of it of why she's, does it ever explain why she leaves her her husband and and she has children too that she leaves right? Why does she do that? So she yeah she basically abandons her kids. She shows up at court in this like devil may care curlers in her hair smoking a cigarette and she's like yeah give them to you know give the kids to their father. Ostensibly, we get a sense that she feels like they would be better off, and I think she says something to that effect in the court, but. She's just sort of aimlessly wandering. She doesn't really seem to care that she got fired from a job. She doesn't seem to really care about her kids, you know, other than she was gracious enough to hand the custody over. Maybe the name Wanda is, is a cognitive wandering. You know, so Could yeah. be. It sounds very similar. I mean, you guys weren't alive then, but that sounds very much like the disillusionment that sort of started to creep in to the, you know, the the beatnik encounter uh, movements of the 1960s. Like, are we going to change things or or what? Is the world, does it have any purpose? Is God dead? Like these are, you know, the malaise that started to set in, especially among those that were part in some ways of the economic have-nots, but still had almost a, a tremendous, like almost a pornographic amount of junk, even though they had nothing. You know, people were wondering, what is it about? You know, is it about a TV dinner? Uh, Is it about, you know, being able to just have a bunch of free time? You know, the sense of rootlessness, of of a lack of purpose, you know, comparing that to life in the, you know, during World War II and and Depression before that, that's what it was like at the end of the 60s. Uh, There was a sense of, you know, free love, but also like, what are we doing? What is our country about? Um, Why are we fighting this war in Vietnam? Is the president a crook? So, you know, it, it's possible that she sort of represents, you know, Barbara Loden's character sort of represents sort of the, you know, the every woman of America at that time. She's definitely wandering and not, doesn't really have a clear purpose or a clear vision until she meets up with this guy. And then her whole purpose is to just get him to where he's going, which is, <laughs> weirdly enough, Holy Land USA and Waterbury. Uh-huh. And there is actually a place that you guys visited. The Kolakowski family happened to visit the, I guess, the area where they made that film and where the Holy Land site is, right? That Holy Land. Right. So it's abandoned now. It's been abandoned for about 40 years, but they, the owners leave it open to the public during daylight hours and they try to keep it up that it's safe enough. There, there were murders that took place there. It's a pretty... But there weird. were like kids having an Easter egg hunt while we were there. Yeah, it was very bizarre. Nights. Yeah, it was. You know. Easter Sunday, it was. So the character that uh, plays her lover, uh, Michael yeah. Higgins. So Michael Higgins is going to meet his, his character in the film is known as Mr. Dennis. <laughs> I guess he doesn't have a first name. So Mr. Dennis is co- trying to find his dad. He wants to make up with his father. His father is a preacher. His father is a pastor, but. They kind of present him in the movie as like the guru like of Holy cult, Land like USA. Yeah, like like he's just there at Holy Land USA holding court, basically, is kind of how he's presented. Mm-hmm. And Mr. Dennis's demeanor actually really changes when he gets to his father. And it's quite a long sequence at Holy Land USA also, which was also kind of bizarre. I don't know if they were like excited about the camera work or what. But his whole demeanor changes and he turns from this like abusive jerk who's basically consumed with committing crimes and has zero conscience to this like kind of almost childlike figure in front of his father. And then 
he basically abandons her. He abandons Wanda after they get there. And she has some more misadventure and basically ends up in a roadhouse where people are treating her really nice. Uh, so she, and who knows how she subsists? We don't know. Yeah, we don't know. We have no idea. So basically the movie doesn't, you know, it, it goes on this, this quest. Um, and unlike films that I mentioned before from the, from the thirties, forties and fifties, where the couple would be apprehended and somehow go to prison and maybe take a turn for the better or for whatever it is or die. She's never caught. And neither is, uh, neither is, uh, Mr. Dennis. Essentially not. And you feel unsettled at the end. You know, you've just been on this whole journey with her and you're just sort of like, okay, I guess she's okay. She's here with these people who are feeding her. I mean, it's a, very much that 1970s anti-hero oh, story, for sure. but it's an anti-heroine instead of an anti-hero. Mm-hmm. And people, I mean, there's a whole article on the Criterion website about, it's called Wanda Now Reflections on Barbara Loden's Feminist Masterpiece, but I'm not really sure what's so feminist about it, you know? Her whole... Do you even see it as a masterpiece? I think it is a masterpiece. I think it's a very interesting movie, and I think it's probably culturally important for the reasons that you mentioned, Rabbi Kivlevich, but it's it's definitely not feminist. <laughs> I mean, she basically, her whole self and her whole uh, sub- sustenance relies upon this criminal man, and he mm-hmm. she lets him beat her. She lets him take advantage of that's part of the point that I think uh, when I'm looking up here in my supercomputer that Ben Mankiewicz talked about when he introduces the film on TCM, he says that that Loden wanted to show people about what it was like to be abused and people should know that they're not alone. So, yeah, you know, and that way, I guess, you know, she's in some ways headstrong, but on the other hand, she wants to be taken advantage of. She wants to attach herself to somebody and the person is obviously worthless, but at least she's abdicating the responsibility for herself to be a, you know, put together human being. Let's talk about the violence and sex content. Is it appropriate for for the projectionist Smicha viewers? There's, there's no nudity in it. And the, it's quite violent. It's quite disturbing. The violence Sam Peckinpah like violence or just no you? no um not that bad but it's it's very real you know they don't hide anything he's definitely ducks her a few times and she's flies across the room and it's not cute it's really a harsh look at this relationship and and uh, kind of a domestic abuse situation so viewing it 50 years uh since it was made do you think it's a cautionary tale do you think it's the type of thing that someone who watches it can say hmm i've got to hear the warning signs do you think it's acted with you know your husband asked you if you thought it was a masterpiece do you think the acting is real or it's sort of like i think the acting is very real i think it's beautifully shot i think it's beautifully acted it's a weird story. It's a disturbing story. And I think just the masterpiece of it is the fact that she spent so little money and made such a beautiful film. It really is like visually pretty, you know, like very um, sweeping shots. And well, I don't know, it's, it's very atmospheric, but it's in that dingy kind of early 70s way. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You know, we talked on this program before your appreciation of Mike Lee and his uh, the BBC films that he made, the television programs that were also featured on Criterion earlier. Do you see any similarity between Mike Lee and uh, Barbara Loden here in this way? Is it's it's the same type of thing that like you know sort of you know grotesque caricature type people and coming together, or it doesn't have the humor at all or the insight? It doesn't have. It's there's no humor in it. Zero. Uh-huh. If you want to feel, I mean, again, I'm, I'm just speaking from my lens. If you want to feel real depressed <laughs> or alternatively feel real good about your own life um, and that you're not, you know, being <laughs> decked across the room, a dingy motel room by some real criminal scumbag, then watch, this is the film for you. <laughs> I see. 
It I'm, is. I think it's important just because it's this low budget independent film made completely made by one written, directed and acted um, that that is a snapshot of a, a moment in time and a social commentary, just like you said about, you know, what are we going to do? What do we do here? Aimlessness. With it, being called, with it being called feminist, do you think there's a, I never seen this movie, by the way, just do you feel that this is a life that she's choosing? Like maybe she feels that this is what she deserves or maybe she, she... does. She resigns herself to his abuse. Basically. She's yeah, like, well, think, what can I do? Do you think she, kind of an attitude but do you think it, there's like there's something masochistic about it that she's you know it's hard to say because her life is pretty terrible from jump you know her sister's like when are you getting off my couch <laughs> but she chose all of it I mean, right she thing. left her husband yeah that's true that's true but and she does choose to stay with this complete like, it, jerk it, 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 this is it it's not presented as a morality tale of don't leave your husband. No, it's not at all. It's, it's, it is more of a slice of like similar life, sort of similar to Mike Lee, where it's like, here's this story. It's super, we're not, you know, we're not hiding anything. In other words, it it doesn't need a grand ending or great transformation of its characters. Right. There's no denouement except for when Mr. Dennis goes to visit his father. And that's more psychological and bizarre almost because he so it really doesn't it doesn't really have what we call the magic of classic hollywood filmmaking oh, no. independent this film there's nothing magical about this movie yeah, right right so it's yeah it's bleak, so it's hard to you know it's painful <laughs> but i think it is worth watching others have said that we've lost a great director because she died just a couple of years after that from breast cancer and um you know, people talked about the fact that she had learned a lot from Kazan and this might have been a, a new directing voice uh, and she could have maybe gone from there to produce even greater films. So, you know, it, it, we, when you have these one shot wonders, I think what happens is we tend to over glorify and, and romanticize. And I think the same thing is true by James Dean as well. I mean, sure. you, know, you know, you know, James Dean clearly, you know, he made uh, these three films, you know, Rebel and East of Eden and Giant, and uh, you know, and the the rest is you know, sp- he's lived, put this way. Had James Dean continued to act, he wouldn't be any less famous than he is now. You know, he he's 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 the icon of of this comet like talent, and everybody could say, well, look what a waste he could have been, and you know, who's the next James Dean? I don't think people say that about Barbara Loden. I never even heard about her, but I think we 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 tend to at least film aficionados and, and, and people who are involved in this tend to, I think, overplay the significance of, of, of certain contributors. I'm, I'm happy that the film has made such an impression upon you. It seems like it clearly, you, you're recounting it from memory, although you told me off pod, you, it was almost a year ago or so that you saw it. So, yeah. so uh, it, it, it sounds like it, 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 it stuck its tentacles in you. And I guess you're at, you're, telling our audience, you know, go see it and tell us what you think, I guess. I'm going to take a 180 degree turn. Let's talk about the outer circle of love, the circle of love that is, you know, a community love before we get to what we call deeper romantic love. And I want to suggest a, a film that emphasizes this and love of what you do, love of the people who you work with, and of course, it can include your family and, and your children, but it's it's all part of your sense of place in society and community. And maybe even the fact of where you are in terms generationally. And this film was very new to me, and I, I was really impressed by it. Uh, it's from 1935. It's called Mr. Cohen Takes a Walk. Now, it has an interesting history of why this film uh, was produced and developed. Warner's had some money behind it, but it was basically produced by a by a British film corporation using British actors. There was a, an, a, a film act that was passed in Parliament in 1927 and then 28. I think it was uh, enhanced and then redone again in 1936, which said that 
uh, assert the distributors had to distribute British content. The films had to have British actors had to be based on British works of fiction or nonfiction that were adapted. Uh, The main stars had to be British. And of course, Brits have been doing this, by the way, for years since then. I mean, the whole BBC and all the type of domination they wanted to have uh, of the television airwaves, they have tried to sort of like plug the holes in their sinking empire for so long. I mean, again, Mike Lee uh, included, what they, uh, the government has always been afraid of being boulderized and taken over by the intense ingenuity and creativity and power of the American filmmaking or American television companies. And that's what the Brits wanted to do to legislate was the house of rothschild that that carlos was in at that time one of those movies also so you, again there's a list if you go onto wikipedia you can see what what these movies were so let me tell you what what, what they did it's like what they did was they set up these dummy corporations and they they did these films that they called quota quickies and what they were able to do is produce these films um, they had the know-how with American, what they had done in Hollywood, but they just transplanted it there They and they filmed it in the studios there. And they were able to turn a quick profit. Some of them were considered very, uh, in terms of production values, very low, uh, but it satisfied the British law. And this way, the, the American blockbuster could still be shown and still reap the profits because, well, you see, look what that distrib- the distributor was able to to satisfy the overlords by showing them that most of the movies, 75 or 80 percent of what they're showing is is English content, even though let's say, you know, the, the big movie from America that came in, the Busby Berkeley musical, or whatever it is that they would show was clearly all made in the USA. So these films were ignored for a long time. They were considered throwaway films. And it's due to film geeks and people trying to find content that they have been rediscovered. And the film that I'm talking about was a, as I said, Mr. Cohen Takes a Walk. And it it stars a Jewish German refugee named Paul Greitz. Paul Greitz died the next year. This was the only film that he was in where he was the, the putative star. Uh, looking at the cast and, and watching the film, it seemed to me uh, that there was probably only one other Jew in the film, but it was all Jew face. Many of the all the other characters are English actors playing Jews, but incredibly not playing them in a heavily accented, uh, stereotypical, grotesque way. Basically, these this family, uh, the Cohen family, owns a chain of very expensive department stores. And and, and Mr. Cohen himself, uh, Jay Cohen, was a peddler who built himself up from nothing, uh, seemingly from uh, somehow escaping perhaps from other parts of Europe with his accent, who started with nothing as a peddler and then a small shop, and then through grit and determination and the genius of the of the Jew was able to create these this beautiful, efficient department stores. And of course, this was a reflection of the truth. In Germany and throughout Europe, these huge department stores were primarily owned by Jews here in the United States as well. Sears and Roebuck, Macy's, Gimbel's. The idea of everything in one sh- place and a department, this was a Yiddish, uh, a Yiddish Einfall. And, and, and Jay Cohen is a, a great example of a person who knows he's Jewish, recognized. In fact, the whole family is very obviously Jewish and wealthy. Even though these were the types that the Nazis would point to as the parasites, this film, in many ways, is very sympathetic, extols them, understands them, and recognizes that you know that they deserve what they have, the servants they have, the Rolls Royces that they drive. But the film is about the fact that things have gotten so have gotten so developed that Jake Cohen feels useless. Everything is mechanized in the store, so to speak. Uh, His son, 
who doesn't have necessarily his acumen, but knows how to be an efficient controller, uh, has everything. There's a light, uh, an electric bulb that pops up uh, when something is needed in the store. Uh, and he, because he's the official CEO and owner of most of the shares, he needs to sign papers about various takeovers, uh, various things that they're doing with various buyers. But he's not, he misses being important, working, sweating, contributing, changing. And that's really the the struggle that Mr. Cohen has. Before he goes on his walk, and that sort of recreates his youth when he was just a peddler going in the English countryside and meeting all these stereotypical sort of English uh, villagers. Uh, he goes down to, which is sort of like the Schmata district of London, and he goes to visit uh, an old friend who has a small shop, a small maddish small shop, uh, Abraham Levy. So Cohen meets Levy. <laughs> the Koyan goes to the Levy, and when he goes there, he's, his eyes look around, and he sees, when he looks at his books, that, that Levy has been making mistakes. And this, and although there's no brachos, there's no Pesach Seder, the one religious moment uh, that is purely religious, other than the very end, which I don't, I don't want to spoil completely, is when... Levy asks him to look at the books, or and, and Levy has to leave the store, and Cohen can now, in a way, feel that he is the center of a, of, of a small little uh, shmata store. He puts on a yarmulke, and he rolls up his sleeves like this is this is the what the big day Cohen got to wear, right? Like like in other words, the Jewish merchant is supposed to look like a religious Jew, right? So even though Levy and Cohen even in a later scene when Levy comes to be Menachem Ovo Cohen, none of them are wearing, uh, there's no yarmulke, there's nothing. The only place where he actually puts on his his hat and looks like he's ready to daven mincha is when he's ready to stand behind the uh, the counter of the store and wait for the customers to come in and check the books. Almost like that 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 the Jewish religion was their strength as sellers, their strength as bargainers, their strength as knowing how to deal with material and market it. And that sort of like was that hearkened them back to their religious roots. You can tell that they they went cheap on the production values because when one character is dying, you can hear, I think, Yosela Rosenblatt's Cole Nidre somehow being played in the back as the person is dying, because I guess that's what they felt that they would come up with. The film also has a, a subplot dealing with his youngest son, who's been sent to New York, uh, who, who on the way there, on the way back, meets a, a, a girl called McConnell, and they have fallen in love. That's the most Jewish name. <laughs> yeah. so cohen and mcconnell so that's really again the typical ab's irish rose type of thing where you know the irish and the jews are coming together uh here in britain as well when cohen tries to break the marriage up uh, and he meets old man mcconnell there's a, a reference to what's going on in europe and germany where they talk about especially now in these times we can't let religion be a factor especially with so much hatred out it was, it was interesting that this was sort of the way the, the filmmakers were trying to sort of uh, uh, sort of neutralize what they knew was the anti-Semitism that was growing in Germany and other places was, you know, like like the Svara that you know, was told to Mendelssohn by Lavater, just, you know, give up, you know, stop. Why should you insist on, on acting like a Jew and, and, and doing all these Jewish religious things? Uh, that's the reason why that there's that's the reason why there's been so much hatred, especially today. We have to realize that we can't stand on these type of bad at all it's, it's so uh, you know counterintuitive to, to us it's, it's right because totally we've uh, because as, as as history taught us just a number of years after that that you know the, the, and hitler proved that you can't run you can't hide and that this is right that that that's exactly what he was after people just like the cohen's the the more secular uh, the, the worst of a chance they would have to really uh, be able to even bond with their Jewish fellow men who were going to be herded up and, and killed. But again, without seeing the shadow of the Holocaust on the film, the film is in a way a very positive portrayal 
of a, a very wealthy Jewish family, but also about finding your role by by when when, when even though he's older, uh, Jake Cohen discovers that he can still chop wood. He discovers he can still give advice. He discovers that he's still needed. And he has to just recalibrate himself. He's able, and again, this is not such a spoiler. Um, there's a, obviously the Empire stores have thousands of employees. And his son, although is a maybe knows how to cut a deal uh, with some other company and be able to uh, to perhaps turn a profit in some way, doesn't have the people skills and the understanding and the love that uh, Cohen has, that Jake has. And Jake is able to somehow avert, I'll just spoil this part, when he sees a newspaper and he realizes that uh, the strike is happening, he somehow hitches a ride with a pig farmer. And of course, the typical joke is, oh, you know, he looks at the back and he sees the pigs. You know, he doesn't want to get in with the pigs, but he gets in with them anyway. And um, he's able to he's able to come to the store and stave off the strike and obviously give in to uh, the demands of what the workers want because he is still from the old school and he recognizes that he still has a role. It's He's helped out by a beggar that he discovers on the road, an old woman who he sort of spends the night with, of course, not in any sexual way whatsoever, but some old woman who's a peddler, um, and her horse. He also picks up a dog on the way uh, who's full of fleas. And it's, again, the film really, it it moves and it's in a way, I wouldn't call it gripping, but I really see it, you know, (laughs) very different than your film, Chava, of Wanda. He's taking a walk and he's going, but he actually discovers himself. He finds himself. And despite, you know, recognizing that he's in the third act of his life, he still can see himself as, uh, as a solid contributor uh, to the larger family that he's connected to and the love he feels for them and the love they radiate back. So that's Mr. Cohen Takes a Walk. It's interesting to note that when it was distributed in America, they changed the title to Father Takes a Walk. <laughs> in other words, in Britain, with all its anti-Semitism that rears its head so often, you could say Mr. Cohen. But somehow the, uh, the distributors of Warner's uh, were worried that the name Cohen would be too Jewish for them. I, I think it's been overlooked as a, a film that deals with the, the story of of Jews in the 1930s, and I, and I think it does a, a, a quite a great job. I'm, I'm a big fan of Gratz, the 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 actor, the uh, Paul Gratz, who I don't know if he was related to Heinrich, <laughs> the, the famous uh, or notorious Jewish historian. Can I ask her a question? Sure. What attracted you to this movie? Was it just the Jewiness of it? Or was it, are you particularly interested in these films? Okay, so I actually did not, I actually, I actually, although I presented it historically as as a byproduct of the quota quickies, I'll be very candid with you. What happens is when I look at this um, platform of TCM and, you know, you know what it looks like. It's like, you know, it's like a bunch of windows of you know about you know of, of about 200 i guess movies i guess you can see at a time and you can pick one of them right right um and you know and you know it's it's sort of like i've seen so many of them and 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 seeing the name cohen meant something sure and and even the sort of like the innocuousness of the title mr cohen takes a walk it's interesting that that i i think the film is based on you know, it was directed by uh, William Bodine. Yeah, and it was, I was and, just about to mention that. <laughs> yeah. Looking at that, we just watched one of his, uh, I think he made The Ape Man, didn't he do that? I don't know. I, I know he made, we were. We were yes, he did. He made The Ape Man. Yeah, he made, he made uh, he, even into the 60s, he, he made uh, Billy the Kid versus Dracula. Oh. He, he directed 402 films, William Bodine. Okay. Uh, that's that is quite incredible. So you know, this was one of his, I guess, more of his early things. But it's a good question, Chav, I, and, and and I'm very happy that that I fell into it because, you know, I I I thought it would just be you know ridiculously syrupy, but I, but I think it's actually uh, a, an important con- contribution to Jews in film, and it, it's much that's more high bi- praise. That's yeah. high praise, especially from that time in history. Yeah. 
I, I think it's much more benign and realistic than some of the stuff that was in the early 30s in, in the U.S., where you you just sort of like want to hold your nose from the exaggerations that the film does. I think this film, um, you know, treats the Jewish characters as obviously Jews, but as as human beings, uh, as opposed to archetypes. Uh, they're trying to represent something. And funnily enough, I just, you know, I think that that's also with Wanda. She's very human. You know, she's flawed. She's not just, I mean, she's lovely, but she's not just a lovely woman. She's a person. Right. I, I also want to mention that that the book that it's written from, uh, I guess it was, it might've been a short story, was by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. Oh. Hmm. And Mary Roberts Reinhardt is, of course, an American writer. I would say Mr. Cohen Takes a Walk is is an anomaly. I think that part of the problem of 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 presenting, you know, wealthy Jews or or is is that there's either this victim ideology or the, the sense of especially in, in early films in, in the US, most of the Jewish characters were there for comic relief. There's such a trope. Yeah. Even even Lubitsch who uh, was a Jew, obviously, and understood the Jewish story, his Jewish characters, even in To Be and Not To Be, although they have a certain element, which is really about, you know, Nazism and the rise of of, of Hitler, even there, the Jewish characters, I believe, are, you know, meant to sort of, I guess, tragic comic. And I think you can take that all the way to Jack Crusher in The Apartment, which is also, to me, one of the great, portrayals of a jew on film you know he plays the doctor um in the apartment and we we've 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 talked about the apartment on this program before this film i think really you know avoids that trap it's about this family and, and the family is really about where it's at and i think in some ways it, it it's could really be shown to modern audiences let's say even jewish schools about the threat of assimilation and why there was perhaps uh, such an allure to assimilation, and why it, it, you know, <laughs> you know, there, you know, why you know the idea of crossing over and marrying out of the religion started becoming acceptable. And I think this film, in many ways, can be an indicator of of what was happening in Jewish life in Western countries and where where the aspects of religion had gone. I think the idea was that society, just like the Enlightenment philosophy was, that society would advance to a place where we would share so much in terms of our values that the religion that got us there could now be thrown off like crutches that were, un, that were, that were not needed anymore. The Zion that they're both trying to reach is one where the, the, they're throwing off the Omal Hushamai, meaning like, the, the the certain secular idea, the certain secular Zionist was the mitzvahs were just to get us through Gullus until we got back to Eretz Yisrael, and this is you know this is just to get us to this point where we you know we're and they both see it as an eschatology you know a fulfillment of an eschatology of you know here this is this is the kibesi based feel of Cholhamim perhaps you know but that's not it's not really how we look at it you know unless uh, unless it's something of the whole Agayim, Agarim, Grurim, that every, you know, the whole, the, the Safa Brura has to be, that Poy Chalamim Safa Brura, you know, it's. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you look, it's look, it clearly, you know, most of, especially the, 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 the backers, the people that were making this film, uh, the people who they were hoping would sit in the seats and watch these films uh, were not the activists. They weren't the people that were arguing for a sort of a revolutionary look at what Judaism needed to be saved. Right. Uh, these were people that were going to uh, be happy with a depiction of obvious Jews who had made it, who were settled, who actually, and similar to the screwball comedies of the time, uh, were uh, affected somewhat by the same sort of foibles that other families had, but were able to, you know, unlike the screwball comedies, there's nothing really silly about this film. It really, it really has... Uh, especially in its last part. Uh, look, I'm a sucker whenever there's a dog in the movie. You know that. So especially, you know, when, you know, when he, when, when he becomes this beggar, uh, who's meeting this dog, I will tell you, there is a, a, a an interesting scene where he tries to stop a, a young fellow from stealing a, a, a chicken 
from a kitchen. And when he tries to stop him, when uh, Mr. Cohen tries to stop this young guy who doesn't have a job because of the depression in England, the owner of the house, uh, it sounds like he's some sort of pastor or preacher himself, lectures him about stealing. And he tries to explain that he hasn't really stolen anything. Um, he was trying to stop him from stealing, but he shuts his mouth. He doesn't blame the other guy. Uh, he, he he takes the uh, this uh, his macabre that he was the one that was the thief, although he was trying to stop the thieving from going on. The pastor decides to teach the two of them, including old Cohen, a lesson. And he says, look, I'm going to make you, I'm going to feed you and give you a great meal, but you're going to work. So he gives them a great meal that they sit, of course, it's not kosher, of course, but he sits there and eats the the non-kosher meal at the pastor's table. And then afterwards, uh, as I said, he chops wood and they do other work, other gardening around the house to earn their meals. In other words, part of what the, the, the film was, first of all, saying was that there's certain universal value of work that everybody could share and could really break the barriers. It was also a certain response to the intense poverty that really uh, was uh, uh, endemic in all over America and Europe at the time. And part of it was saying, you know, okay, you're right, there's no jobs, but if you, if instead of just becoming the heap, like I'd say going back to Wanda and just, you know, going with the flow, work, decide that, you know, be more inventive, industrious about the type of things you can work for. Again, not spoiling anything, when Cohen sees that this guy is a pretty decent fellow, he gives him a letter to be handed to his son, uh, who's still taking care of the store, to give him a job, which is, again, I, I believe a very uh, a, you know life-affirming, work-affirming type of philosophy. Now, again, no, in other words, the film was not stirring up the pot, but I think in many ways, compared to what came after and compared to the way things spiraled out, it's almost like an oasis uh, to join Mr. Cohen on that walk. <laughs> I sort of feel that despite the irreligiosity, uh, there's just something uh, pleasant about uh, having a film without a heavy, without anybody who's evil, and yet having an arc of, of understanding. There's no costume drama here. It's, 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 a, it's a part of its times, but I think it's definitely still worth a look. So those are our two films for tonight. So take a look, my friends, tell us what you think of it. This weird pairing of Mr. <laughs> Mr. Cohen and Wanda <laughs> taking their walks and, and discovering something about themselves. Take care. It's watch your step on the way out. We'll catch you next week. Be well. Thanks for joining us for another episode from the Yeshiva of Newark at IDT Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a single episode.